a way to be right with God apart from keeping the law. There is a way that has been revealed to be right with the Father apart from keeping the law. Romans 3, 21. Next to me is a model of an olive press. And this olive press tells the story of that way that's so important to us today. So let me tell you just a little bit about uh, this olive press. Or actually this would be an olive mill, uh, which would be a part of a larger olive press. Olives were very important in Jesus' day. It really was a part of their economy, a part of their culture. Now they did not eat olives. In fact, what we eat as an olive today would not even have been recognizable to them in those days. Olives, even when they're fresh and ripe, are very hard and very bitter, and they are inedible. But they made oil from olives, and that oil was very important to them. They used the oil uh, to light lamps. They used the oil for medicine. They used the oil for food and for cooking. They used the oil for ceremonial religious purposes. They used the oil uh, for washing and cleaning themselves and their clothes. Oil was very important. So let me tell you how they made the oil. And so an olive press, an olive mill in Jesus' day would, would look very much like this. Uh, there were some a little larger and some a little smaller, but this would be typical. Uh, the olive press would be made out of limestone, carved into a large limestone boulder. And then there would be a, another uh, limestone millstone that would be placed in this. You perhaps have heard of a millstone. This is what it would look like if it was used to uh, process olives. Uh, there were different shaped millstones uh, used to process different foods. People are most familiar perhaps with the millstone that they would use to process grain, and it was a large disc. But this is what it would look like for the production of olive oil. So the nation of Israel, especially around the city of Jerusalem, just covered in olive trees. That was true then, still true today. And these olive trees, of course, that's the source of the olives. Now, all olives are green, but they darken as they ripen. As I said, they're hard, they are bitter, they are inedible. But what they would do when the olives would ripen, they would shake the branches of those olive trees, and the olives would fall, they would gather them up, and they would put them in a press just like this. They would fill it about three inches deep, and usually a person, sometimes an animal, if it's a very large press, would begin to roll this heavy stone over those olives, grinding up the olives, the pits, everything into a paste. The paste looks very much like cooked oatmeal, uh, but it's a uh, lot darker. Uh, dark brown, maybe a little bit of green. And then, once they had completely crushed the olives, they would take the paste and they would put it in a cloth bag that looks a lot like a burlap bag to us today. And this cloth bag filled with this olive paste, these ground up olives, these bags would be stacked one on top of the other. And when they had a, a total stack of these bags, they would take a long beam and it would be stuck in a notch in a wall on one end. It would cover the stack of olive press, olive paste bags. And then on the other end, they would hang weights on the beam. They first would hang one weight and one kind of oil would be produced as they would press the first time. Then they would hang a second weight a different kind of oil was produced, and then a third weight, and then a third, it would produce a third kind of oil. Now we'll talk more about those in a moment, but let me tell you what the common word of the day 
what they call this olive press. The word, perhaps you've heard it before, is the word Gethsemane. You may have heard it in the context of the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is just the Aramaic word for olive press. And so when we think of the Garden of Gethsemane, it was the Garden of the Olive Press. And so Jesus and his disciples often went to this special garden. It was at the foot of the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives, small mountain, but a mountain covered with olive trees. And then at the bottom, there was an olive press, almost exactly like this. And there was a garden where people could sit and gather and talk as the olives were processed. And the disciples of Jesus would gather there, sometimes late at night, and they would pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Press. Now, Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he and his disciples go to that garden. And Jesus is there right next to the Olive Press. And on that night, the night before he was crucified, in that place, Jesus was pressed, so to speak, three times. It's no accident. Nothing in the Bible is an accident. No accident that Jesus on this important night goes to the place of the pressing of olives, this lifeblood of the people. And there he was pressed emotionally, spiritually, mentally. He was pressed three times. And we learn something from that pressing and from that all of press. So I want, to, I want to just read the story to you from the Gospel of Matthew. This is real history. This is a true story. It's recorded in all four Gospels, but we'll read mostly from Matthew. And so if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 26, but we'll show you the verses on the screen. It'll be easy to follow. So Matthew 26, 36, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, the, the garden of the olive press, and he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Take him along, Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee, this is three of the uh, disciples that Jesus was closest to. So he took these three aside, and he said to them, uh, he was sorrowful, it says, in verse 37, and trouble, and he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Now, two very important things we see in those verses. First, it says that Jesus was sorrowful and troubled. What could that have meant? He was sorrowful and troubled. Well, we have to understand that Jesus has come to this long-awaited moment in time. This is a pivotal moment. Jesus, for all eternity, has been looking forward to this moment, the hinge point of history, where Jesus dies for the sins of all men. This is something he would have dreaded in his human, in his fleshly life, from the, from the moment he could understand. Jesus knew when he went to that olive press, that garden that night, that he was just 12 hours away from being nailed to the cross and there hanging and suffering for six hours and dying an excruciating death. And the Bible says that he was sorrowful and troubled. The physical pain of crucifixion is would be terrible, the emotional trauma would be something to be dreaded. But really there was something even worse here that weighed on Jesus. Jesus, though he had never sinned, would bear the weight, the guilt, and the penalty of sin for every person that ever lived in the past and in the future. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin. God took my sin and your sin. He put that sin on Jesus. And Jesus bore that sin, the guilt and the penalty of that sin on the cross. And on this night before the crucifixion, that weighed so heavily on Jesus. He was sorrowful and troubled. But the verses we read also say that he was deeply grieved to the point of death. Now, there is no exaggeration in the Bible. When it says he was deeply grieved to the point of death, that means he almost died. When he turned from his disciples and he walked a little further into the garden to pray, he caught a glimpse of something. He saw something in his mind's eye that was so terrible, that was so horrible, that it almost killed him right there. The grief was extraordinary. He almost died died. Now what do you think Jesus saw? When he turned from his disciples, he begins to go deeper in the garden. He sees something, almost kills him. What did he see? Well, I think what he saw was, was just my sin, my rebellion, my selfishness. And he saw your sin, the details of your sin, and the sin of every person who's ever lived. And he saw that sin, and it was so terrible. The thought of bearing that sin was so terrible that it almost killed him. Now, there are two things here that, that really are hard to understand but are important to fully appreciate the, the pressure that Jesus was under. The first thing is the perfection of God, and the second thing is the sinfulness of man. So let me see if I can explain those just briefly. The perfection of God, we call this the holiness of God. God, whether you look at him through the person of the Father, God the Father, or you look at him through the person of Jesus the Son, or you look at him through the person of the Holy Spirit, God is perfect. He is holy. He has never sinned. He has never considered sin. There's no sin, no shadow of sin with him. Because God is perfect and holy and righteous. He cannot and he will not tolerate sin. In fact, the Bible says it this way, Habakkuk 1.13, Your eyes, Lord, are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And so we have to have an appreciation and understanding of just how holy, just how perfect, Jesus was. But also, we need to understand something of the sinfulness of man. It's hard, I think, for us to understand just how bad our sin is. Now, the Bible says sin deserves death. The wages of sin is death. But just frankly, I don't know how many of us believe that. I mean, sure, I've done some things I shouldn't have done. I've said some things I shouldn't have said. But I'm not ever even going to jail yet. Hopefully, well, um, so how could it be that my sins are so terrible that my sins deserve death? Well, the Bible says that even the best stuff in us, that we're so quick to point to, even that is corrupted by sin because it, it, it comes from a heart with wrong motives, selfish motives. I think the best way, the short way for me to explain just how sinful we are uh, is, is to talk about the fact that life comes from the Father. God is the source of all life. And so if God is the source of life, and if sin in my life separates me from God, then sin separates me from the source of life. Sin separates me from life. And because of my sin, I will have eternal death. I will forever be separated from life, ultimately in a place called hell. I think another way perhaps to try to understand this uh, is to think of the fact that sin has so corrupted our ability to comprehend its seriousness. Well, we just don't see it. I heard a, a preacher number of years ago tell a story, uh, true story I think, his, uh, 
about his son, four-year-old son. So this uh, preacher, as he tells the story, he had, he had just bought a brand new car. It was his first brand new car in his entire life. He was very proud of it. He brings it home, shows it to his family, and uh, everybody's making a big deal about it. He's got a, some young children. They're, they're happy because mom and dad are happy. And then he shows off the car. But then he just puts it in the garage, and they're going about their business, and nobody notices that the four-year-old has disappeared. Until a little later, they hear something in the garage, and they go out there, and the four-year-old has found a, uh, a wire coat hanger that's been stretched out, uh, I don't know, stretched out so they can fish something out from behind the couch or something. And, and this four-year-old had taken that wire coat hanger, he just wanted to please his dad. He decorated the hood of the car. He scratched in designs of this and that. And he was so proud of that, but the dad was furious. And, and he thought, my son has no idea what he's done. This is going to cost me a ton of money. It's not covered under insurance. And I'm going to have to take off work, take the car somewhere to get it painted. I'm going to have to get somebody to come pick me up from there and take me back to work. I'm going to have to get a ride home. And then two weeks later, the car will be painted. I'll go. I won't be happy with it. I'll have to get into an argument. They'll have to paint it again. I'll have to get a ride back and forth. Then I'll have to give them a whole bunch of money. And then I'll never be satisfied. And every time I get in that car for the rest of my days, I'll still in my head, I will see those scratches in that hood. My son, what has he done? And so he looked to his son. He was going to explain to him the, uh, the crime he had committed. But his son just smiled, and the dad realized that the son just simply didn't have the capacity, just didn't have the capacity to understand how bad his scratches, his artwork was. This pastor said that he just picked up his son, squeezed him tight, and said, Son, just don't decorate Dad's car ever again. You know, we're that four-year-old boy, and we just don't have the capacity to understand how terrible our sin is from the perspective of a holy and a righteous God. God says, if we could understand, we would recognize our sin deserves death. Our sin deserves death. So here's what we know. We're guilty of sin. We'll stand guilty of sin forever. Nothing we can do can ever change that, right? Even if I live a perfect life from here on out, it'll still be true of me that I was guilty of sin in the past. Our sin separates us from God. And left to our own devices, we are without hope. But if you remember at the beginning, I shared with you that there is revealed a way to be right with the Father apart from keeping the rules. And that's good news because we've blown it with the rules. But there is a way to be right with the Father apart from keeping the rules. I want to give you some Bible facts as we go through this uh, the story, the historical account of Jesus at the garden. And the first Bible fact is this. Jesus hates our sin. Jesus hates our sin. Well, let me read the next verse. 39 says, going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now it's important to understand that the cup here equals the crucifixion. When he talks about the cup, he's talking about the crucifixion 12 hours away and everything that's associated with the crucifixion. And so Jesus here paid, prays a very unexpected prayer, an odd prayer. Jesus goes to the Father and says, please, let's not do this. Is there any other way? Is there any other way? Can this cup, can the crucifixion and all that's associated with it, can we just set that aside? Is there another, is there another way? This 
is is Jesus's second, uh, uh, first, I should say, his first pressing. Jesus is under such mental anguish. He's under such stress. He's being pressed. He's being pressed. That they all would press, when they pressed the olives three times, Jesus was being, was being pressed. I'll tell you something about the cup of suffering. It's more was more than just the physical discomfort of the crucifixion. This cup, this crucifixion, contained all of the guilt of all of the sin, of all of the world, of all of history. And it contained the undiluted wrath of a sin-hating God. And Jesus on that cross would endure the condemnation that was due to us. And so he agonized. Pray the prayer, Lord, Father, is there any other way? There was such agony in that prayer. I want to read to you just one verse from another of the Gospels that gives us some further details. In the Gospel of Luke, it describes that prayer this way. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. He's under such stress that he is bleeding through his sweat glands. Say, is that real? It is. Uh, it's called hematidrosis. And it's, a, it's a, a malady. People suffer from it today. It's caused by just extreme anguish and stress and extreme pain. And Jesus here, at the Garden of the Olive Press, Jesus was being pressed. As he asks if there's any other way. Now, what did he mean? What did Jesus mean when he asked the question? Is there any other way? Is there any other way that man, that me and you, could be forgiven of our sins and made right with the Father other than Jesus being crucified? Don't you believe if there had been another way, God would have announced it right then? But the clear message of Scripture is there was no other, no other way, no other way. Well, let's continue to read verse 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he asked Peter, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? So disciples taking a nap. Uh, verse 42, we'll skip a verse. It says, again, a second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So he's gone back to pray further. This is his second pressing. And so he's going through this new language all over again. He is being pressed again as he prays. And you might ask, why? Why is Jesus struggling so much with this execution? Haven't there been other people through history who have, who have been executed and they have walked with courage to their execution? Well, there have been, but this is different. You see, Jesus' agony here, as we've already said, is not so much about the physical torment of the cross. It's about the guilt. The guilt of all mankind being placed upon Jesus. And listen to this. And then the Father in heaven turning his back on Jesus, forsaking Jesus. <laughs> rejecting Jesus. Jesus on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And Jesus, who has been in perfect fellowship with the Father for all eternity past, Jesus knew that that fellowship was about to be broken and that when the sin of man was placed on the shoulders of Jesus, that God would have to turn away God would have to reject him, abandon him, forsake him. And that was such a terrible thought to Jesus. It's pressing him in this, in this garden. Why do you think Jesus would undergo such extreme suffering like this? Well, that brings us to Bible fact number two. Jesus loves me and you. Jesus didn't suffer for himself or for the Father. 
Jesus suffered for us. Now we'll continue reading verses 43, 44. It says, And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. And after leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. So this is his third pressing. Remember the olive? They were pressed three times. Jesus now, his third pressing. And here Jesus reaff reaffirms his choice. Listen. His choice to die for us. To die the death that we should have died. To die for us. You know it was a choice. In fact, the Bible says in John 10, Jesus said, I lay down my own life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. Jesus had a choice. He didn't have to go through this. He could have said in the garden, Father, I'm out. Not a good plan. I'm coming home. We're not going to do this again. But he reaffirms the choice that he had made in eternity past to die for our sins. In this third pressing, in this final pressing, Jesus is resolved to die for us. In the last two weeks, I've had a lot of conversations, and some of you have as well, with people who want to talk about suicide, self-harm, some things that have gone on in our community. And, well, it's just brought the conversation to the forefront. And I've had people ask me if life is really valuable. Is my life worth living any longer? Well, if you're thinking those thoughts, I hope you will find your answer in this third pressing. Thursday night, Jesus is in the Garden of the Olive Press. He's under the greatest stress and strain in history. He's sweating blood 12 hours from the crucifixion, crying out to the Father. And right then, Jesus reaffirmed his decision, listen, that your life is worth his death. Jesus believes your life is of great value. Jesus reaffirmed in that third pressing, he resolved to die for you because he so values your life. That brings us to Bible facts number three. Jesus highly values your life. Jesus said, you are worth dying for. And that tells us that our lives are worth living. They be hard seasons and difficult times, but our lives are worth living. And Jesus makes that clear. Now let's go back to the olive press for a moment. I told you that once they made the paste, grinding the olives, putting them in the bags, stacking them up, they would press these olives three times. So the first pressing with one weight on the beam, that produced a very pure oil. We would call it extra virgin olive oil. You probably have some in your home. And that oil was used, at least one primary use for that oil, was in the temple. They would use it as an offering. When they were guilty of sins, they would bring to the temple an offering to ask God to forgive them of their sins. And that offering was not sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. It only looked forward to the perfect offering that would one day come, and that perfect offering is Jesus. But this first olive oil was used as an offering to God, a guilt offering. Sometimes it was just poured out on the altar. Sometimes it was... Uh, poured on other offerings. Sometimes it was baked into bread that was offered. But this, this purest olive oil, the olive oil of the first pressing, it was an offering to God for the forgiveness of sins. Now then they would add the second weight and it would produce more oil. This is the oil that uh, in part was used for lamps. They would light a lamp, an olive oil lamp, to light their homes, to light their buildings, 
was used for white. And then the third pressing, when they would put the third weight and they would get the last little bit of oil out of this paste, that oil was used to make soap. They would take the ashes from burning a flowering bush called a soapwort, and that, those ashes would be very alkaline. They would be like a powdered rye. They would mix it with this third pressing, this oil from the third pressing, and it would make dove bath bars, essentially, and they made soap. Now, I told you, a couple of times, it was no accident that Jesus prayed these three prayers, that Jesus was pressed so terribly three times next to the olive press where these olives, the lifeblood of Israel, where these olives were pressed three times. So here's the, all of that for this. What does the olive press then tell us about Jesus? What does it tell us about the way to be right with the Father apart from keeping the law? Quickly, three things. Number one, Jesus can be our sinless sacrifice for the penalty of sin. Just as the first oil, the oil from the first pressing was used as a offering, a sacrifice for the hope of forgiveness, so Jesus becomes the perfect offering for our forgiveness. Jesus becomes our substitute. We're guilty and deserve eternal separation from God. Nothing can overcome our guilt. We need a way to be right with the Father that doesn't include keeping the rules. And Jesus said, I'll be that. Jesus said, I'll be that offering. I'll be that sacrifice. See, here's the fact of life. Either you will pay for your sins or Jesus will pay for your sins. In the garden, Jesus said, I'll pay. Now, we must say, I'll trust your pay. We must say, your payment, that's enough. One of the questions that we ask sometimes, you perhaps have heard this question. Suppose you were to die today and stand before God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? You've died. God says, why should I let you in? You know what most people would say? If we went around and just listened to people's stories, most people would say, well, I've... I've tried to be a good person, I've tried to be a good dad or mom or wife, or I've tried to be kind and follow the rules. I've tried, I've tried. I'm a better person than a lot of people I know. Better person than you, Pastor. Listen, I've tried to be a good person, and I trust that that's all true. You have. But you know what you've also done? You also sinned. And the wages of sin is death. It's not enough good people, activities you can do to erase guilt of sin. So suppose you die today and you stand before God and he asks you why he should let you into heaven. There's only one answer. Lord, I don't deserve it. I deserve separation from you forever in a place called hell. But Jesus has been my offering. Jesus has been my sacrifice. Jesus has been my substitute, and he has died for me. And that is enough. Why should I get to go to heaven? Because of what Jesus has done. How can we, we be right with the Father other than keeping the rules? Because we've blown the rule part, right? So how can we be right with the Father other than keeping the rules? Jesus kept the rules. Jesus died for our disobedience. The first pressing produced the oil for offering, and Jesus is the oil for offering. He is our sacrifice. The second uh, oil, you see this on your outline, teaches us that Jesus 
can be our light and our guide through this dark world. So the first oil offering. The second oil, light. Jesus is our offering, but he's also our light. I told you it's no coincidence that Jesus chose that place. It's a long way from where he was earlier in the evening. That they walked all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Crest. There's no coincidence because of what we learned here. That second pressing of oil produced the oil that they used for light. Jesus not only is our offering, but Jesus is our light. Not only does he offer us forgiveness, but he offers us direction and guidance to help us to see in a dark world, to make decisions in a dark world, to navigate uncertainties, to, to have marital peace, to have our families thrive, to know love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. He gives us light. He gives us light in our spirits. He gives us light through God's word. Jesus is not only our offering, but he's our, he's our light. Becoming a child of God, it begins with trusting what Christ has done on the cross as our offering. But it includes, it includes following Jesus' direction. Making Jesus the leader and the Lord of our lives. He desires to be our offering. He desires to be our life. <laughs> then the third, the third thing we see here is that Jesus can be the soap that provides a fresh start. So the first oil, offering. Second oil, light. The third oil, soap. Jesus is our offering. He is our light. He is Sometimes we just need a bath, right? Sometimes we just need clean clothes and a new start. Back in Ocious, Jesus wants to be your offering and your light, but then he wants to be your soap. For those who trust Jesus as their offering, for those who ask Jesus to be their light and their guide, he wants to give you a fresh start. He wants to let you begin again. He wants to wash away the impurities, the sin, the failures, the regrets. He wants to give you a new start. Listen, a new start today, Resurrection Day, can be a new start for you, for your marriage, for your parenting, for your family, for your, for your joy, for your peace, for your purpose. It could be a new start today. Those who trust Jesus as the offering, those who follow him as their light, will experience him as their soul. Psalm 51, 2, Psalmist said, Lord, completely wash away my guilt. Cleanse me. See, the soul cleanse me from my sin. Jesus can give us a fresh soul. I don't know why you're here today. I know some of you, I don't know many of you. We're so glad you're here. And you may have come because somebody invited you. Maybe somebody twisted your arm a little bit. Maybe you're here out of curiosity. But you don't even know why you're here. Just something is drawing you to be here. But my prayer is that since you're here, today can be a new start. That Jesus will be your offering, your light, and your soul. So what do we know? Jesus was pressed. And then he chose to die. Reaffirmed his choice to die. Paid the penalty for our sins. And to offer us forgiveness. And a new start. And eternal life. I want Easter 2023 to count in your life. I want you to look back on this day, no matter who you are or where you are in your faith journey, I want you to look back on this day, and I want you to say, Jesus on that day gave me a new start. Some of you today, your new start begins with trusting and surrendering. 
You've, you've been around religious things and maybe you've said some religious prayers, but there's never been a time in your life when you said, I'm a sinner, I am hopelessly separated from God. My only chance is to trust what Jesus has done for me. I trust that. And I want Jesus to be my life. I want him to lead me, be the Lord of my life. For some of us, that's where it needs to begin. In fact, that's the only place it can begin. Today, you need to trust and surrender. Let's say those two words together, okay? Today, you need to trust and surrender. You can do better. Today, you need to trust and surrender. Okay, other people have trusted and surrendered, but today you need a fresh start. Today, some area of your life, you just need a fresh start. That's only going to come from the Lord. You need to ask Him, give me a fresh start. Maybe you need to talk to somebody today. You need somebody just to pray with you. Pray that the Lord will give you a fresh start. Maybe our church needs to be the church that helps you find a fresh start. But Jesus is your soul. And he wants to wash you clean and give you a new start. And that can happen today. This is one of my favorite verses in the book of Acts. I'll close with this, I promise. Acts 22, 16. You may not know these people, but the Apostle Paul was... He had, made, he had, had an encounter with Christ and Somebody by the name of Ananias was speaking to Paul. Listen to what he said. Why are you delayed? Get up. Be baptized. Wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Today can be a pivotal day in your life. You can become today a child of God. And you can have a new start today. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, just as Jesus made the choice in the Garden of the Olive Press, we all will make the choice in the Colosseum of the Blessed Faith. So let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to say a brief prayer, and then we're going to sing. And nothing about today is designed to put you on the spot. But if we could help you make those decisions, if we could pray with you, answer questions, encourage you, when we begin to see, I want to ask you just to take a step out into the aisle and go to the top. Somebody will guide you around, and we have some very friendly.